Well, I think the crowd is cheering here for the Bulls right now. And the Pistons as they leave the court. I don't think they're cheering for the Bulls, but uh, I, I think the greeting is for the Pistons as they are headed off as time runs down. Pistons wasting no time in getting out of here. They left the bench, although the 7 and 9 10 seconds remaining. The Pistons just left. You saw it last night on Last Dance. The best thing about rivalries is that 29 years later, they're still not over. Those were the Pistons refusing to shake the Bulls' hands as they walked off the floor. Last night, Bill Lane Beer with Rachel Nichols. His thoughts all these years later. I and cried for a year and a half uh, about how, how bad we were for the game. But more importantly, they, 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 they said we're bad people. We weren't bad people. We were just basketball players winning. And that really stuck with me because they didn't know who we were or what we were about as individuals in our family life. So all that whining they did, why shake their hand? They were just whiners. They won, they won the series, give them credit. We got old, they got past us, but okay, move on. Do you regret now not shaking their hand? Do you stand by no. that? Why would I regret now today? I don't, I don't care what the media says about them. I never did. If I did, I'd be a basket case, uh, especially back then. Uh, so, you know, it just, I was about winning basketball games and winning championships and did whatever I had to do to get the most out of my ability and our team. And we did. We, at the end of the day, we're called world champions. So that's an interview Bill Lambier did with Rachel Nichols. It'll air in its entirety on the jump today. Meanwhile, Isaiah Thomas is going to join us in a second. We're getting that hooked up technically. Jalen Rose is obviously ready for a man that you grew up idolizing, and I know that well. It was a fascinating night last night, and I'm told Isaiah is ready to go. So the thing that we were always happy to have Isaiah Thomas on the program, but what we specifically wanted was to give you the chance to respond to what Michael said. So for those of you who saw it last night, you saw it. Michael Jordan on that moment last night on Last Dance said whatever Isaiah says now, you know it wasn't his true actions then. You know there's time enough to think about it or the reaction of the public that's changed his perspective. You can show me anything you want. There's no way you can convince me he wasn't a blank. And I'm not allowed to say the word on TV. Again, the best thing about rivalries is that 30 years later, they're still not over. Here's the Hall of Famer Isaiah Thomas. We wanted to give you a chance to respond. Isaiah, what did you think? Well, I, first of all, let me just say this. I, I speak for kind of three things here. I speak for the city of Detroit. I speak for the Detroit Pistons. And then I also speak for myself. So uh, watching, the, watching the documentary, I, I think it's interesting. It's, um, it's fun. It's entertaining right now. And I think the sports world needs it. In terms of how we felt at that particular time as champions. We were coming down, Michael Jordan was coming up. And in coming up, you have certain emotions. And in coming down as champions, you have certain emotions. And I've said this many a times, looking back over the years, had we had the opportunity to do it all over again, I think all of us would make a different decision. Now, me, myself, personally, I've paid a heavy price for that decision. Uh, and, and in paying that price, you know, I, I understand that this is the sports world and everything else. But at the same time, uh, looking back over it in terms of how we felt at that particular time, our emotional state and how we exited the floor, we actually gave the world the opportunity to look at us in a way that we never really try to uh, position ourselves in or project ourselves in that way. Uh, so it's, it's unfortunate that it happened, um, but you know, that's, that's just how it was during, the, during that period of time. Zeke, I'm going to turn you over to Jalen in a second, but I wanted to ask just one more thing, because it was always my perception, as one who covered the league at that time, that your team, your group, thrived on the image of being the bad boys, that you there were some athletes who love that disrespect and love to be hated by the fans, and it motivates them. How would you describe the way you felt then and feel now about having been the bad boys? You know, it's just interesting looking back over that, that era, Greeny, because, you know, when, when I came into the league, and I, and I really have to contextualize this for everyone watching, uh, because... When I came into the league, the Philadelphia 76ers and Dr. J were the champions. And then Boston became the champions. And during the period of the 80s, it was Philadelphia, Boston, L.A., 
in Detroit. Those were the four champions. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, only Boston and LA, that's not, that's not accurate. There was the 76ers, there was Boston, there was LA, and then there was Detroit. And at that particular time, we had a chance to do something that none of those franchises had ever done. We had a chance to three-peat. And we were going for all three-peat in 91. And really, it could have been all four-peat because in 88, we, we, you know, technically we could have won that game too. But, you know, we, we didn't. So going for that, that three-peat, for us, emotionally, it was... You know, it, it was draining, but it was also disappointing at that time to lose. And I remember when, when, when we played Boston and, you know, when Boston exited the floor. And I remember, you know, going back in our locker room and we're celebrating and everything else. And, you know, for us, it was OK when, when, when Boston exited. It was OK when, when Larry Bird exited. We, we never... We never looked back and said, oh, they were poor sports. They were bad champions. We were actually grateful of the lessons that they had taught us along the way in terms of how to win, how to become a good team, how to be a, a solid franchise, how to have rules, how to have regulations, how to, how to be disciplined enough to go out and to compete every single night to earn and win a championship. That's what the Boston Celtics taught us. That's what the Los Angeles Lakers taught us. That's what we learned from Philadelphia. So the, the moment in time that we're talking about here, we didn't, we've never asked for an apology from the Boston Celtics. And I don't believe the Boston Celtics ever asked for an apology from the Los Angeles Lakers. I don't believe the Lakers ever asked for an apology from the Philadelphia 76ers. You know, those were the times, unfortunately, there was a time period that changed, and we may have got caught in the middle of that time period. Go ahead, Jalen. A few things. Isaiah, you know how much I love you, the Detroit Pistons, my hometown, and those bad boys teams. Can you contextualize for the audience what it's like to try to oppose what everyone <laughs> so very beloves? And you talk about the lessons that you had to overcome based on the fact that you guys walked off without shaking the Bulls' hands. But as a basketball player and as a Detroit native, y'all were putting on for the city. And I saw y'all yeah. had to overcome some Mount Rushmore of obstacles. And when today's fan sees LeBron James, I'll also ask them to think about this. He's not more beloved overall than Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, or Larry Bird. So what was it like to compete against those opposing forces and be disliked just for the fact that you had the nerve to even beat them? That, that, was, that was a difficult time for, for all of us. And, and, and our journey has, 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 hasn't thoroughly been told. Um, you know, we trying to beat the Lakers at that time, trying to beat the Celtics at that time, you know, when, when we beat the when we beat Chicago in '88, Jordan was the MVP of the league. When we beat the 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 Lakers in '89, Magic was the MVP of the league. Magic was the MVP of the league in '89 and '90. Magic's when Magic was the MVP of the league in '90, he did not make it to the NBA Finals. We actually beat Portland. Bird, I believe, was the MVP of the league in in '86, and Magic again in '87. So those were the those were the, the three MVPs of the league during my time. And having to beat all three of them uh, and how they were beloved and how they were looked at. And also the city of Detroit, what we were going through at that time. Uh, we, we were always not only as a basketball team looked at as the underdog, but the city itself was looked at as an underdog. Now, this is where it becomes truly problematic. Because the language that was being used around the Detroit Pistons, and I, and I think this language hurt everyone, but more importantly, this language, I, I think, really hurt Bill Lambeer. Because the, 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 the racialized language that was used around the Pistons of description in terms of calling us thugs, saying we were bad for basketball, 
uh, saying that we didn't earn or deserve the championships that we had fought so hard to win. And I don't think Lambeer has ever been called a thug in his life. Mm. Uh, but, but, but going through all of that and, and still rising to the top and still having high standards for yourself and still having the discipline to go out and compete and to work. You know, I, I, I watched this, you know, it, it's fascinating to me because I'm getting an inside peek at the rival uh, of the Chicago Bulls that, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't see behind the curtains. Uh, the, the, the problems that they had and the disrespect that they had for Jerry Krause, their president and general manager, if, if we would have treated Jack McCloskey that way in Detroit, it, it would have been a problem. Um, you know, Jordan is in the Chicago Bulls. They are, they are, you know, they're rewarded for lifting weights, getting stronger, becoming mentally tougher. That's what you're supposed to do to win a championship. You were not going to beat the Detroit Pistons if you wasn't physically fit, if you wasn't in the best shape of your life, and if you wasn't mentally tough, and Chicago and Michael Jordan did and became all of those things. But while they were losing to us, they weren't those things. Now, you shouldn't be rewarded for lifting weights. I mean, we got high school kids now lifting weights. Right. I mean, being, <laughs> being physically fit and, and wanting to be in shape and get better, that, that's, that's part of becoming a champion. And again, to Chicago's credit, they did that. Isaiah, hang on one second. I, I'm obligated to take a commercial break. I, I hate to ask you this live on the I'm air. Can here. you come back in four minutes? Okay, yeah, stay I'm with here. me. Jalen, can you come back in four minutes? Because there's a very important Absolutely. question. One very, very important question that we did not get the chance to ask that we will do in a moment. Isaiah Thomas and Jalen coming back in just a moment. We are back on Get Up this morning after episodes three and four of Last Dance aired last night here on ESPN. And the spotlight, particularly in episode four, was on the legendary rivalry between the Bulls and the Pistons. And it culminated in that moment that we've been discussing here with the great Isaiah Thomas, the Hall of Famer. Good enough to stay with us. Thank you, Isaiah, for doing that. And Jalen with us here as well. And Isaiah, I just wanted to ask you about one thing you mentioned at the beginning. You said for that moment, for walking off the floor as you guys did, that you feel you've paid a significant price in your life. What did you mean by that? Well, you know, as Jalen sits here with, with, with his Detroit uh, shirt on representing, you know, you know, Detroit probably, you know, I, I represented Detroit in, in, in the west side of Chicago where I came from. And, you know, the, the fact that I have to sit here today and Jalen, Chris Weber, Steve Smith, who, who I work with, you know, the, you know, the, the hurt that those guys feel for me having to be in this moment, uh, I apologize to them in Detroit for all of us in this moment. Uh, because as, as a leader of the team and as a leader of that community, uh, why I'm personally hurt is another reason why I'm here. Because being left off the dream team, that, that, that personally hurt me. In, in 1980, I was on the Olympic team. As a matter of fact, I was voted the male athlete of the year in 1980 for the USA Olympic team. And, uh, you know, the only thing that's missing from my resume is not being on the dream team. Now, when the dream team was selected and I wasn't a part of it, there was a lot of controversy around it. And I still don't know, you know, who did it or 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 why they say I didn't make it. I know the criteria for selection of making a team, I had fit all the criteria. And and that's a big hole in my resume. That that is the biggest hole in my resume. That is the only place and that's the only thing on my resume that I did not succeed at. Uh, you know, I, I graduated from college. I got a master's degree in education from the University of California at Berkeley. On the educational side, I've, I've succeeded. Uh, in the sports arena, you know, I've won at every level. And, you know, I tried to do everything correctly, and I thought I should have made that dream team. However, I wasn't a part of it. That hurt me. And looking back, if, if I'm not a part of the dream team because, you know, uh, a lapse in emotion in terms of not shaking someone's hand, 
if that's the reason why I didn't make the dream team, then I am more disappointed today than I was back then when I wasn't selected. Isaiah, you're a legend, you're an idol, and I appreciate your humility and being willing to apologize to the city of Detroit and so many people that are fans of the team and yours, but you owe us no apology. You put on for us like no other. I saw you out there with a busted ankle hobbling around, giving us buckets, giving your life. I saw you drive to the basket and suffer a ferocious elbow from Carl Malone that busted your eye open. And had you out there looking like a boxer, can, and you still can, can you, to put can on you for say the that again? <laughs> Wait, can, you, can you? Because th this generation thinks that the only one who was getting hit back then was Jordan. And Greeny, you covered a lot of those teams. Sure. I can I can say on this television station here today, there is no player during that period of time that got hit and punished more than myself. And I have all the scars to prove it. Correct. And, that, and that's why I brought that part up, Greeny. And another thing about him being left off the dream team, they took our head coach, Chuck Daly. We had just won back-to-back -back championships. They took our head coach and left our NCAA champion, NBA champion player off of the squad. And lastly, I have to say this. Here's another thing that his legacy suffers from, and, it, and it, this is what pains me. When we start really highlighting who are like the top 15 or 15 players to ever play in the NBA, y'all need to start putting some respect on Isaiah Thomas' name. And the little guard conversation, that boat is sailed. I love Steph Curry. I love Isaiah, uh, uh, Allen Iverson. I love those guys. But Isaiah Thomas had to go against Magic, Jordan, Bird, and we sleep on the Cavs. They were really good with Mark Price as well, and you brought up the Sixers. So for all of those war wounds that you put on for the city of Detroit, you're an educated man, you're a disciplined man, I appreciate your humility after watching last night's documentary. Uh, thank you. And, and Greeny, you, you guys, y'all had a poll up um... – you know, earlier, I think with uh, with Brian when he was on, yeah. And you asked him who was the last team to to uh, defeat uh, an opponent after after three uh, after losing to him three consecutive years. Yes, and that was the New York Knicks. Now, this is what this is this is the interesting thing to me. After the Detroit Pistons, the Knicks took on the Pistons' bad boy identity, the Miami Heat took on the bad boys' identity. And there were a lot of teams that took on our defensive identity, our offensive philosophies, and everything around the sport that we brought into the sport, you can trace it back to one team, and that is the Detroit Pistons. Bill Lambeer set the record in the Portland series. I think he made five consecutive threes. And at that time, Greening, a center shooting from the three-point line was unheard of, mm -hmm. right? Yes. I still hold the record for the highest field goal percentage in that Portland series in the NBA Finals. I think I shot uh, like 68 69% from the three-point line. We were a team that played outside in. Now every team has a center that shoots a three. Every team has a little point guard that, you know, does, and has three guards. I mean... So the influence that we've had over the league over the years has been astronomical. However, everybody could play like the Pistons, but the Pistons. <laughs> we, I have to leave it here because we, the show is literally going to end. Isaiah, I'm told you're going to be on First Take later today. I can't tell you how much we all appreciate you doing this. Thank you very much. Jalen, we love you. We will be back in a moment here. Thank coming. You. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.